Welcome back to our General Dynamics Information Technology Panel on Government Cloud Brokerage. Who, what, when, where, and why on Federal News Radio. And my guest to talk about cloud brokerage today, Maria Rode of GSA, Pete Brandano of General Dynamics Information Technology, Keith Trippi of the Homeland Security Department, and Stan Kazmarzik of GSA. And we have a sense, I think, now of what people are doing in the cloud. Maria, you contributed to that. I wonder if you're starting to get a sense of what people from agencies are coming to you and saying, it's, I'm happy to be able to find through FedRAMP certification um, people that can help me do X, Y, and Z. Um, but I, I wonder if this is available or I wonder if that is something that I can do in the cloud. Maybe they can and maybe they can't. But what are the things that you're seeing the FedRAMP model maybe applying to either soon in the future or a little farther out? You know, uh, the, the FedRAMP model itself was a concept of uh, do once, use many times. Instead of all the agencies, each going to every cloud provider, getting their own accreditation, you know, uh, issue the accreditation once. And many agencies can do that. So that whole concept of doing once, use many times, a lot of people have looked at that model and said, you know, it's working. You know, I, I don't know if this is the first time it's working across the federal government, but it's working. And a lot of people are saying, well, how do I apply that to other things? How do I use that? You know, part of the FedRAMP model, um, instituting the third-party assessor organizations, you know, who are those organizations that go out and do the testing, that look at the cloud providers, that do all the test cases, that run all of those? And they're the independent arm that looks at the cloud providers. We've had agencies come in and uh, ask us, how is that operating? How is that third-party assessor organization working? And we just privatize that. Now, while the government maintains the, the oversight, the governance piece of that, you know, all the work accrediting those third-party assessors, whether rather than having the government do it, we've got A2LA doing that for us now, and they're doing that piece to accredit those third-party. Now, uh, my office has the final oversight and the final approval on that, but people have looked at that model for that 3PAO, how we stood it up, how we operated it within the government, and how we privatized that to really t look at that and say, you know what, I have labs across the country. I have a small federal staff, and I can't get out there to do the accreditation and do the work. How did you privatize that? How can I do that, and how can I more efficiently use my staff to do the oversight, maintain the governance, send that out to an accreditation body like A2LA, and there's others out there for those labs. So we've had uh, agencies come to us, and the lab model was one of those. One of the agencies came to us and said, how did you do that for the three PAOs? Because we want to do something like that. So the FedRAMP model, I think, just overall, not just the do once, use many times, but the third-party assessors, how do you privatize that accreditation process? So we've had a lot of inquiries on that. And I know, Keith, you have and I have talked before about the idea that applying this concept, not mm -hmm. just the cloud brokerage model, sure. but we'll talk more in detail about that too. Mm -hmm. But this uh, do once, use many times mm -hmm. is really appealing mm -hmm. to an agency like yours. First of all, it has different pieces that do things differently. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the legacy issue earlier. Um, but also how this could scale and, and fit a number of different things at the same time mm -hmm. and just make your life a lot easier in a tight budget environment. Sure, and I think even before the budget, there were, there are folks around the government that are saying, look, I, I don't have to build it. It doesn't have to be mine, right? I think mine's an interesting word in government that I'm expecting that as we move from I have to build it myself to more of a service sort of culture, the word mine's probably going to be reduced over time. And I tell my staff all the time is, if we can get it from somewhere else, that's the first place we'll always look. If we if we do have to do something and build it on our own, I expect that we're going to share that. We have a project called the Car Wash, and that kind of touches with what Maria was talking about. You have agencies that are consumerizing their data, making it available to others. You have agencies that are building mobile apps. Do we really need 26 agencies building this thing called the Car Wash, which will do automated scanning of security, 508, and, uh, and quality management. Well, of course not, right? It's a potential shared service. So the concept around shared services, whether it's around something innovative that's trying to drive change around moving from an agile to potentially down the road, a DevOps model, or leveraging some of the good work that Maria's doing, the business model of it's not mine and that's okay, and I'll reuse other services. I think that mindset is starting to shift in the federal government. It certainly is working on shared services over on the financial side. We're 
certainly supportive of that in, at, uh, at DHS and, and what OMB and the folks over at FIT are trying to do. I think that's the business model of the future. I really do. Do you get pushback, though? Or have you gotten pushback when you've tried to do that? Because I know uh, yeah, Margie's talked to us about mm -hmm. the, the car wash concept. Sure. That sounds like the kind of thing where there'd be somebody or some group of people mm -hmm. to say, well, that's not how we've done it before. So sure. what well, do you here's see what's there? Interesting. Yes. This is a culture. This is a business shift. This is gonna, not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Could take a generation to fully implement this sort of cultural change. What we've seen, though, with the car wash is it's around mobile. Mobile so new to everybody. There wasn't a lot of that sort of pushback against that. And quite frankly, most folks are so busy building mobile apps or consumerizing their data, they don't have time to build this thing called the car wash. Mm -hmm. It's up. It's available. Anybody in, in the federal space, if you've got an HTML5, you can use it. So what we did strategically was go after a capability that no one had in a new marketplace. We didn't say this is for any application. Could this work for any application longer term? Absolutely, right? In the future, we're not going to say we're going to build a mobile app over here and an app over here. We're going to build a service, and we're going to make it available on a 4-inch screen or a 21-inch screen. It really doesn't matter which screen it's going to be on. And Car Wash helps put the federal government closer to the path of being able to do continuous integration and DevOps, which is, again, another trend that's going to take maybe a generation to happen. But it's all built around, I don't have to build it myself. I will leverage services that are available to me. Maria? Yeah, I think uh, Keith, Keith hit on a, uh, you know, a really key point here about the trust across agencies. I see that a lot with the FedRAMP program. How can I trust somebody else's work? How can I trust your work? And I think key to that is transparency, you know, with with what, what Keith's doing on the car wash. Here's what it is. Here's how it operates. With the FedRAMP program, it's not just about do once, use many times. It's being transparent and showing agencies, here's the work we're doing and here's how we're doing it. And I think that applies to the car wash and a lot of the other work agencies are doing to enable them to trust each other. You know, there hasn't been that culture shift, but it's happening. So, it's Stan, it strikes me that if culturally people are a little nervous about some of these new developments, then the approach that you're taking on not creating whole new vehicles for people to, to buy this stuff makes a lot of sense because once they get to the point where they're comfortable with using the new business model or different way of acquiring uh, the things that they've uh, than they've done it before, when they come to you, they can go about getting that stuff the same way they have in the past. That's not new and crazy to folks, it's, it strikes me. Yeah, the other issue is, you know, it takes time to put acquisition vehicles in place, and technology moves faster than the federal acquisition process does. So by the time we get, you know, emails of service, BPA in place, you know, agency, you know, it's, it's almost outdated as far as what it offers the agencies. But what we can do is, is a much better job of helping agencies use our existing vehicles to obtain the cloud services that they need, and we plan to do that. Um, I think you get the understatement of the day when you say technology moves faster than the federal <laughs> acquisition process. You, you win that one. Uh, Pete, from your perspective, that, that quick moving uh, mm -hmm. issue is probably one of the benefits that you see mm -hmm. of the cloud brokerage concept in specific, but in a lot of the concepts that we've talked about in general, I imagine, because you can respond at that speed for whatever the agency needs. Absolutely. Our hope is to be able to continuously build our catalog by working ahead of time proactively to, to get contracts in place with the cloud providers to make it easier because we know, again, what the, what the customer wants in terms of, you know, terms and conditions. So if we can bring these services on, then it should be a lot easier to bring them to a vehicle that works. Um, you know, for example, we, you know, we recently just were awarded in the state of Texas for a cloud brokerage that is nationwide to all, all 50 U.S. states. And the concept is, you know, to continuously build that catalog so that any agency within the state or across the United States could actually purchase that, uh, purchase those cloud services. And that also includes, to Keith's point, services that the government develops themselves. So being able to share services, you know, between government agencies or between the states, I see that as a huge role for, for cloud brokers to be able to help to facilitate that and to work through some of the common challenges, you know, with, with contracting and, and between the various government agencies. Um, you know, I think that that's something that doesn't often get talked about, but I think that it's going to be a, a big, big role for a broker. I want you all to shine up your crystal balls for a minute here, and I want to go a year, 18 months, two years, maybe even farther out if you want to. Think about what you're doing today vis-a-vis -vis the cloud brokerage model. At some point in the future, what's success look like? What has worked well 
where are we in the process or whatever where you can say, yes, between uh, the beginning of 2014 and where I sit today, this process has evolved the way that we wanted it to do, to, and we can fill in the blank that we didn't before. Uh, I'll go down the uh, line, but I'll start with you, Keith. So yeah, polishing off the old ball, as they say, several things, and it's all about the business model. Today, or a few years ago, IT would take you know, 18 to 24 months to budget, and then another year and a half to two years to contract. So you could be from concept to implementation of three to five year cycle. What I envision the world of the future is from concept to first capability, less than a month, right? Learn something in a week or two and maybe stay that direction, shut it down and move on. Very, very small dollars, and we will be able to learn immensely. The other thing is the actual supply chain around that. So today, what we're planning to buy in IT and the transparency in what we're paying today isn't as clear maybe as I guess all agencies would like. In this newer world, we'll know what our services are going to cost before we buy them. Then it's more of how many quantities do we want as opposed to um, ways that we can't tell what we're going to be paying in the future. So I think that transparency opens up a lot of value opportunities working with the CFO and senior leadership at agencies that allows us to say we can get to market quicker. We know exactly what our costs are going to be. We're managing our risks as it relates to cyber and others. And we are far more responsive to the needs of the mission and providing value to citizens than I think we've been in, in the past. And that's at, at more of a federal level. So time to market, innovation, uh, real value to the to the endpoints, and I think CIOs are going to benefit from that because we're going to spend more time having strategic discussions and less time about is that BlackBerry working or is that is that server not working? Right? But when you talk about that time to market speed, mm-hmm. that's a breakneck speed for right. a risk averse organization like sure. a federal agency. Sure. How's that cultural shift work? We talked a little yeah. bit about culture. That seems like that's going to be a really hard nut to crack. Right. Ab- absolutely. When I talked about the supply chain, the HR aspects yeah. of that. So there are a lot of folks that are that are in college today or in high school today that are going to be coming out, and that's the pipeline that we want to reach out to them. So again, when you look over the horizon, there's a group of folks that are going to be coming in. We want to need to create easier on-ramps to get the innovators out of those organizations into the federal bloodstream. We were competing with Wall Street. We are competing with Silicon Valley. We are competing with a lot of smart kids. That innovation on-ramp and, and providing them a means that says, I absolutely, think about the federal government. I always use a buffet. It's a buffet of mission. There's so many different things. If you're into finance, if you're into health, if you're into to energy, this is the place to be in the government. And I think if we can transform the business model around delivering those services, we'll be able to recruit the future and bring those folks in that are expecting the at-home you know, consumer experience, and we'll be setting that table for them to come over and take it over for the future. So I think culturally bringing some of that younger talent in will help infuse that culture and maybe have the shift happen a little quicker. Stan, what does success look like from your perspective down the road? Well, kind of a more mundane perspective, but uh, assuming that budgets are going to continue to shrink, I think that agencies that are on the cutting edge now of cloud and cloud broker and private sector partners who are also on the cutting edge of providing those services will thrive three years down the road. There's a lot of, lot of discussion around, you know, uh, is the federal government geared to take advantage of the economic model of cloud pay as you go? Is, will the acquisition process enable us to do that? And brokers, do they add costs to the, to the process? But I, I would suggest that the discussion should be around can we afford to do business the legacy way? And we can't. And in and, an and, and era of shrinking budgets, it's not just contract dollars, but it's FTE. We don't have the people to integrate and, and manage these systems. You know, the brokers are going to have to do that. And I think th- if you set yourself up for success now, you'll be able to survive three years from now. Maria, what's your uh, success model look like a couple of years out? Uh, when you look out, you know, I'm going to build on what Keith said as well. Um, when you start looking at uh, the maturity Start looking at 18, 24 months out, the culture shift that has to happen and the trust that has to happen, you know, and I'll I'll focus in on the security perspective, trusting that those cloud providers, they've been accredited so that when they do go to the buffet table, that they are accredited and that they don't have to go through that cycle. And then they say, yep, when I order the steak or the chicken or pick it out of the buffet, that it's ready to go. Um, and, and, you know, that, that goes to shortening the time frame, the acquisition, all of that. So it's not just, you know, one little piece in security, it's the acquisition, but having agencies trust that entire process that, that underlays all of that, I think that's going to come in the next 18, 24 months, but it's going to be a shift. It's going to take time. Pete, I 
I have to confess, I know the answer here, I think, before I ask the question, but I, one vision that I know that you have for the future is that agencies understand the cost model. They know that when they come to a broker, they're not necessarily paying more to get the same service. But talk about what you see as success in presenting this concept to agencies as we look out in the future. Well, I think that, you know, our hope is that in, you know, the next 18 to 24 months that the cream will rise to the top in terms of the cloud service providers and the way that they are working competitively. So it, right now there's a very large, dis, dis, you know, chasm between one provider and the next in terms of what they offer in terms of discounts and what they offer in terms of service levels. And, uh, you know, and what we see is that uh, by brokering all of these together, we're going to be able to generate volume, and those volume discounts are going to allow us to pass on additional savings to the government so that we're not eating away that cost savings that, that cloud promises. We hear that, that uh, a lot, that, you know, doesn't the cloud broker just eliminate the benefit of cloud? No, it doesn't. Absolutely not. In fact, it drives, it drives competition amongst those providers. And so for success, success from, to me says that the government is comfortable to come to a broker and know that they're going to get a, a good price, a fair price for a service that is going to meet those SLAs, you know, because the, you know, again, the cream is rise to the top. The providers that are in the catalog are the ones that are delivering and the ones that are offering the best, you know, value for the, for the price. Pete, you get the last word. I want to thank you all for being with me today. Stan Kazmarzik of the General Services Administration, Keith Trippi of DHS, Pete Brandano of GDIT, and Maria Rode of the General Services Administration. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to our panel discussion on cloud brokerage in the federal government hosted by General Dynamics Information Technology. I'm Francis Rose.